Today, we're back with a very special guest, actually a return guest, uh, the author of the recently published book, Moving Your Brand Out of the Friend Zone, Doug Zarkin. Doug, great to see you again. Great to see you, my friend. How you been? I've been not too bad. You know, it's interesting. I wrote a book in the past. I'm always asked, what was the experience like writing a book? And I'm just curious to hear from your mouth, how is writing a book, I guess, what you expected and in what ways did it throw some curveballs at you? So um, I wrote the book in 16 weeks. Um, I wrote the outline for the book in about 15 minutes. I had the chapter, I had the title of the book before I even started it. Um, but for somebody who cannot spell and has, is a multiple time assault victim of autocorrect, it was a terrifyingly exciting experience to write it. Um, there was moments of clarity and moments of what am I doing? Um, I will share with you candidly that the day before I had to turn the book in for final, final, I was reading the book at the pool Labor Day weekend, and I read the first three chapters, and I thought they were dog shit. And I said to my wife <laughs> at like 2 o'clock in the afternoon, honey, I got to go home. And she goes, what are you doing? I go, I got to just rewrite this. It's not what I want to say. Right. And I rewrote three chapters in about five hours. And oh I'm God. glad I did um, because it's kind of like the opening lean-in, but- what a what a terrifying experience! But at the same time, I'm glad I did it. Don't have any plans to do another one, but I'm glad I did it. What What about the writing experience? Do you think led you to maybe make a misstep in how you opened the book? Is it because you rushed the beginning, or is it because you learned more about the concept as you wrote the whole book? I think I got smarter as I went along. Yeah. Um, when I wrote the beginning chapters, I didn't have the full narrative in mind. Um, I was still kind of working on my writing style, trying to figure out: Did I want to write as I speak? You know, did I want it to be conversational? How formal right. did I want it to be? I was very self-conscious about my experience and, and making it all about what I've done versus what I've learned. Um, and that's very different. And so I found the beginning of the book to be a little bit too self-serving. Um, it was a little bit too narcissistic and it didn't welcome the reader in. It didn't give them that lean in that you and I both know in anything that you do, that that moment of lean in factor to get somebody to want to pay attention is so important. Yeah, It didn't have it. Um, but I had a moment of clarity when I was reading it at the pool. I, I started to see what I wanted to do. And I will tell you, to write three chapters in four or five hours, that's, that's the most I've ever done in the least amount of time. Right. And um, I'm really pleased with how it turned out. Awesome. And, and just diving into the book, so... Just the title itself, break free from the you know the friend zone. It's yeah, you know, we've all kind of been there. I know what it's like sure. from a relationship standpoint. In terms sure. of you know you have feelings for somebody, but they just want to be friends, and you don't really know. And then you get disappointed in the end. What's the correlation between that and and a brand and their customer? And what made you kind of create that analogy as a thesis for your book? So you know, as handsome as you are, my friend, you know we have all experienced that that moment of where our feelings aren't matched by the person um, on the other end of the table. And for me, that analogy really materializes is when you look at sales plan and you find yourself you know missing revenue targets. Right. And part of the reason you miss revenue targets is because when you look at your appeal to people that aren't in a relationship with you, you overestimate it. And you greatly overestimate your appeal with your existing customers to come back. And so the analogy of sort of feeling like you're in a deeper state of relationship commitment with somebody than you are, the the analog of being in the friend zone um, to me just popped. And yeah. it was a way of really simplifying the complexity of that consumer brand relationship that is so hard to figure out. Because you and I both know, and I think your listeners know, that marketing it at its core is about motivating the consumer to do what you want them to do or what you're asking them to do when you want them to do it. Books, classes, seminars, bottom line is marketing has got to get somebody to do what you want them to do when you want them to do it. To do that, you have to have such a blend of arrogance and humility, confidence and insecurity. And that's no different than when you go head first into a relationship in your personal right. life. Right. It's a, it's a fascinating correlation. And, you know, you also talk about kind of the importance of adopting a business mindset and brand yeah. success. And I've seen that, you know, I spent 15 years in the agency world where you see so many concepts that get presented 
and they're like whiz bang ideas, but there's never any thought given to how is it going to impact the bottom line? And I think a lot of advertising has been disconnected from that. So is that kind of the way, cause you have, you work for some of the biggest brands in the world leading their marketing. Is that the impetus behind kind of fo focusing on that business mindset when it comes to brand building? You know, FOMO is not a marketing strategy. And I talk about that in the book and, and you know, how many times have we sat in a boardroom where ideas are being thrown and everyone's like, Oh, we got to do it. That's great. We got to do it. That's great. Yeah. And then you ask yourself, is it something that you must and need to do? Is it something that you should or could do? Or is it something that you want? And when in business, you spend too much time on the wants and not enough focus on the must and the needs, that's when your business goes sideways. And for me, that mindset of building that marketing layer cake and really being disciplined is at the core of driving marketing effectiveness. Yeah. But for somebody who's young in their career, sitting in these meetings, trying to make sense out of a brainstormed idea of how much time and energy to action against it, hopefully, and I call it a guide because I don't believe there's a right way or a wrong way. I believe there's just a way sure. and it's a journey. I, I hope this helps them. Yeah. And you talk about, we talk about the layer cake you also kind of go through like these high performance habits that yeah. like are essential for brand growth. Can you elaborate on like what some of those are and which ones maybe are the most underutilized in your experience? So I, I think it, to me, any success I've had in my career, and I mean this sincerely, has been because I have surrounded myself with great people. Yeah. Um, building a high performing team is a skill and it's a skill that you gain proficiency in over time. But for me, there's sort of three core concepts in, in what I look for when I hire, when I build a high performing team. First, I, I hire for passion. You can teach somebody a skill. You can't teach them the will. And the challenge is, is that if you have somebody who has a lot of passion, but doesn't have a lot of skill, you have to work that hard, that much harder to try to get that greater balance. And so I hire for the skill of what you're selling, right, Doug? Because like if you're no. a toothpaste brand, people aren't necessarily passionate about toothpaste, but they're passionate about brand building and connecting with consumers and other parts about that. Well, it 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 bugs me that there are certain career jobs that I let's say would be dream jobs, but because I haven't worked necessarily in the vertical, right. your resume doesn't appear to the top. Right. But yeah. if everybody who sells soft drinks worked for a soft drink company, you would never get innovation. And it, it takes a leader to recognize that there are translatable skills from other industries that you can bring in to help round you out. So it starts with passion. The second thing is requiring purpose. Um, I need people around me that go about their day with a set with, with intent. You know, we, we never have the size of the teams that we need. Everything is always, I've got 20 minutes worth of work and need that I need to do in 10 minutes. Um, you need people who are very purposeful in how they go about their lives, both outside and inside the office. And then it's about celebrating progress. Um, perfection is not attainable in marketing. It just isn't. Yeah. There is no such thing as the perfect ad. You can get really close, but there's never such thing as perfection. So as a leader, if you're only focused on 100% results, you're going to miss the fact that if your sales target was plus five, but you hit a plus two, you still are up plus two. Right. Celebrate that progress with the team, then dig deep to figure out, all right, what did we need to do? Where did where didn't we where didn't we perform? And but if you don't take the moment to celebrate, you're all about negativity. You're all about what you didn't do versus what you accomplished. Yeah. So I'm curious, did so I think I saw you on TV talking about Super Bowl spots. So yeah. you know, and I, you know, I know you're a football fan, just by looking at the Lawrence Terra picture behind you. Um, I'm an Eagles fan, but won't hold that against you. We talked about that. It's okay. Time. It's okay. We both had disappointing seasons. Yeah. Neither of us played the um, Zerbo. Right. What were your thoughts on, because, you know, it's interesting when you talk about brand building, we often, uh, you know, create an equivalent to TV advertising. And the yeah. way that we really see TV spots is during the Super Bowl. What was your take on the Super Bowl spots this year in 2024? And, you know, how does that kind of weigh against, I guess, your overall thesis in, in the book? There were more misses than hits. Okay. I mean, there were some brands. I just, I can't understand how this creative actually made it out of concept. Right. Um, you know, there were, there was one brand in particular that ran multiple spots during the Super Bowl, probably spent 35 to $40 million. It was some of the worst creative I've ever seen. And what made it bad? Um, I would say executionally, it, it, it was very sophomoric, 
you couldn't really dissect the strategy or what it did. It happened to be for a service and it didn't tell you anything about the service. Right. It used a reverency in its illustrative style, not to give away who I'm talking about, yeah. but almost to the point of agnostic of a narrative. Right. And, you know, to create that critical thing, which is consumers make emotional decisions before they make rational choices, you still have to give them an emotional decision about what. Right. And for some of these, I walked away saying, what the hell was that? Yeah. It didn't make me want to learn more. It actually made me angry that, you know, marketers never have enough money to do what we want them to do. How did somebody get this much money approved with this story? I just didn't get it. And do you think it's really a notion of, I guess, like some type of Stockholm syndrome that large brands have where they kind of create an echo chamber of feedback on something that's completely disconnected from the real world and what their consumer is looking for? Like, is that possibly how it gets out? I mean, look, in, in society today, there is only one moment where you have appointment viewing for commercials, and that's the Super Bowl. Yeah. Um, so much so that one of the big evolutions we saw this year was a lot more money and time spent on trailers for your Super Bowl ads than the ads themselves. It almost created a movie-like atmosphere where you went to the Super Bowl waiting for the debut of the spot because yeah. you had all the great teasers. And some spots had better teasers than they did the spots themselves. Right. Um, I think you can get lost in the allure of I'm on the Super Bowl and it's a it's a it's a badge of honor, yeah. not realizing that if that if you are mediocre, you lose. If you're right. bad, you really lose. That winning formula is so, so small a window that your chances of being successful agnostic of testing and perfecting, I feel like is so slim. Yeah, absolutely. So what are some success stories, you know, more broadly speaking, that you've seen brands execute where they've been able to successfully get out of the friend zone, you know, create that real winning relationship with consumers that has long-term commercial viability and where's the attack. I'm going to, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you two examples that I, that I, that I mentioned in the book. And, and it's because I think they, they practice both the arrogance and the humility. Um, the first one is Delta. Yeah. I'm, I am a Delta loyalist. I will go out of my way to, to, to fly the airline hashtag, not a sponsored ad um, because they make me feel valuable. And during the pandemic, when they could have really blanked out everybody's status, what did they do? They grandfathered your status. They made it actually easy for you to remember that as your life was getting back on track, that they were a valuable partner. They go out of their way to accommodate. And, and maybe that's because of the amount I fly, but I feel like when I travel with them, I always have somebody that's taking care of me. Right. Okay. And even though they've gotten a lot of negative press for some of the way they've done re readjusting their loyalty programs, I actually think as it, as far as an airline goals, they actually really do think human. They actually treat me as if I was their only flyer. And some of the accommodations and some of the flexibilities and some of the, you know, we want to get you home to see your kids, so let me get you on this flight. Just the small moments of care and connection, not to mention the thank you note that comes on your chair when you when you show up as a frequent flyer. Those things mean a lot. Absolutely. Um, another one that I think has done a really good job of kind of moving itself out of the friend zone, um, similar in vain, is Marriott. Um, when Marriott expanded and created Bonvoy and brought in other hotels like W and Weston, um, their there was a real fear that the volume was going to dilute the value of your patronage. And again, I think they do a really good job in small little touches, early check-in, late check-out, a couple free bottles of water, small things that don't necessarily create material value, but they create material love. Yeah. Um, why those brands come to mind is because they're in a service culture mindset. Yeah, experience too, right? They're experience. All experience, yep. The, the, my, my Pythagorean theorem in the book is the brand value equation. Brand value, which is whether you make 50,000 or 5 million, everybody wants it, equals experience divided by price. Right. If you deliver an amazing experience, you can charge a premium price and still have a positive brand value equation. They have realized those brands that they live in an experience economy. You know, I think a brand like Starbucks 
is a brand that forgot the notion of the experience economy and really lost the cachet of I go to Starbucks and I feel really good about being there, not necessarily just because I'm drinking a good cup of coffee, but there's that neighborhood coffee feel vibe. I feel like I'm a, when I carry the cup, I'm showing a proud badge of honor. Starbucks, we all know, is called Five Bucks. Yeah. And Duncan sees the opportunity to sort of be the anti-Starbucks and be the everyman's coffee. And I mean, look, you want to talk about Super Bowl success. What they did was just a stroke of genius. Absolute genius. What, why do you say that? And what was the insight behind it? Um, they, did? they took a highly produced couple in Ben and Jen yeah. and gave you a peek under the hood of, do you think this really happens? Their use of cameos. I mean, the Matt Damon cameo when he utters the bastardized line from Goodwill Hunting, you know, how about them donuts? Yeah, that was great. Then you look over and you got Tom Brady. Then you listen to Ben who dials up the Boston accent. Just the authenticity. Duncan really grew out of that New England culture and they've owned it. They've not tried to be a foofy shishi brand. Right. They, they're they, they, they're they blue story. collar. Yeah. They're they're a blue collar brand. They have a great sense of humor and a reverence about themselves. Um, and I think consumers feel good that when they carry a, a Duncan cup of coffee, that bad badge says something about who they are. That they're smart enough not to spend five bucks on a, you know, double skim vanilla skim latte. And I'm just getting, you know, a good cup of coffee from Duncan and getting a bagel or getting a munchkin and feeling great about it. What does so and and I love that spot too. Uh when you when you talk about experience from Marriott and Delta, it totally makes sense. But what does experience look like for a brand that sells shampoo or bottled water or something yeah. that's much more low involvement category? How can they look at that experience brand equation that you laid out? It's it's when you don't control your point of distribution, the experience that you cultivate has to be in the way in which you educate a consumer before or you romance a consumer after. So content is a huge content part is a yeah. big one. Advice and counsel. I would say, honestly, your customer service. I, I had the privilege of spending a month in Japan learning the Japanese philosophy of customer service. And interesting, in Japan, they look at customer service as an opportunity to strengthen the relationship, not triage a problem. Yeah. In the States, we look at it as an opportunity to you know, triage. Right. If something breaks, if I have a problem and I call the customer service line, number one, do I get somebody live? Number two, do they speak the same language? Number three, do they stop reading from a script and listen to me? And one of the stories I tell um, in the book is is something about a, a ceiling fan that I bought from Restoration Hardware that was two years old that fell because the the mount broke. And I was ready to buy a new one. And I had called and, and said, listen, my, my ceiling fan you know, broke. I, I Can you tell me which one that I bought? I need to buy a new one. And the customer services person on the other end was like, oh my God, are you okay? I said, yeah, it was in my master bedroom. My wife and I weren't in there. She's like, you bought this two years ago. I said, yeah. I said, "Can do you still sell it? She said, yes. I said, can I buy it? And she goes, no. I go, what do you mean no? She goes, it shouldn't fall off the mount. I'm sending you a new one. Didn't ask for a picture. Wow. Didn't ask for anything back. Just didn't want me to feel like I spent a lot of money on something and the quality wasn't there. And I will tell you, I will forever go back to Restoration right. Hardware right. because of the way they treated me. Right. And they're a premium brand. So when you do your equation, you know, if, in order for it to play out, you're actually, you know, given the expectation you have for what you paid, the experience needs to be that much better. Yeah. I mean, I, I had another story where I, you know, my son is, basically eats like five things. And one of the things he eats is a particular peanut butter brand. Mm -hmm. And we opened the jar of peanut butter and we found a piece of plastic in wow. the peanut butter. It clearly was from one of the like nozzles or something it sprayed off. And so it took me about 20 minutes to get the customer service number for that brand. I finally got the number, got somebody on the phone. They said, oh my God, this is terrible. Listen, will you, do you still have the container? I said, yes. They said, would you mind FedExing it back to us? I said, no, we'll send you a label. Great. I send a label. Three months go by, I don't hear anything. So I call back and I said, listen, what happened? Yeah. And they're like, no one's ever gotten back to you? I'm like, no. And they're like, well, we're going to send you a bunch of coupons for free, insert brand name peanut butter. And I was like, that's so lame. Like my son could have choked, you know, I didn't want to make a big deal about it. I just wanted them to know, but they didn't care. Right. They did not care. That's what it came so, down to.
you know, if my son wasn't such a picky eater, I wouldn't buy the brand of peanut butter anymore. Right. But think about all the times that we've had bad experiences at a restaurant or have bought something that's broken or not lived up to our expectations. Does the customer service experience leave you feeling valued or valueless? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's so interesting. And I, I love, you know, the whole take on if there's a problem, if something breaks in a relationship or in a, in a customer business relationship, a lot of people look at it as, okay, let's just put a Band-Aid on this thing. When the reality is this is a chance to end up ahead of where you were before. Because if you over deliver to a problem, you know, then the, the customer usually forgets about the problem and they're just focused on how you provide the solution. And it, it, it strengthens the brand to an entire new level. And that has a accretive effect over time. Yeah, it, it, it's a small moment of care and connection that could lead to big wins. Yeah, absolutely. So looking for, you know, 2024, everyone's talking about AI and your ability to theoretically customize at scale. Obviously, AI also presents, presents a risk of, you know, chatbots where there's no human in the loop and companies in their quest for efficiency being less personal um, and not even being a friend, but being sort of like a, uh, you know, I guess a relationship between data and a human because they're relying so much. What, what are your, I guess, hopes and fears in terms of how brands can leverage AI in the context of the philosophies that you laid out in the book? So I think marketers have to embrace AI. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think to ignore it is silly. I think for a marketer to embrace AI, you have to recognize that AI is not going to do your job for you. Okay. What it does is it allows you to iterate and see things from multiple angles. If you are skilled at AI, you can take a piece of content put in a couple queries and get five or six different versions of said content that play with certain emotions, certain focus yeah. to help to round out um, what you're doing. And I think for us, options are a good thing, but it also could torture you to death. Yeah. So you've got to be careful not to look at AI to be a problem solver, but to possibly be an assister I, I happen to like AI a lot for helping to take a email where I want to convey something that potentially could be challenging to convey an email and optimize it for tone, content, and professionalism. Um, you know, we've all in our history have fired off angry emails and maybe we regret it. Um, I know for me, being able to use AI to help take something that maybe is aggressive and still get the point across without possibly creating ill will is an incredible use of the tool. Yeah, absolutely. So um, should, I wish I could use it in my personal life. I know. I know. <laughs> well, there actually are lots of ways to use it, but they're just slowly kind of coming on board. But uh, I think we'll probably hear a lot more about that this year. Um, so just shifting gears as we wrap up here, Doug, you know, the fact that, you know, you've had a great career, um, you know, in brand building and, and working for, as I mentioned earlier, really prolific brands. We first met when you were leading the Victoria's Secret Pink brand. Decade, over a decade ago. Um, after all you've accomplished, kind of what gave you the ambition and motivation to do something like writing a book, putting yourself out there, going out and doing a media tour? A lot of people think about doing things like that, but never kind of get through to the other side. So yeah. what is it about you and I guess either the way you were raised or the way your career has formed that kind of give, gives you the motivation and confidence to do that, that maybe we can impart on some of our younger listeners here so they can kind of put them their best selves out there? Yeah, um, Matt, it's such a great question. I, I think for me, to whatever degree of accomplishment I may have in my career, I hold equally to the, to the amazing leaders that I've worked for and frankly, the really shitty bosses that I worked for. Yeah. And um, I probably can count on one hand not using all my fingers, the people that I've worked for that I admire and that I would consider mentors. I can count on two hands the people I've worked for that are just people that I don't never wanted to be, but right. learned so much from. If I can help somebody avoid mistakes that I've made in my career, not learning experiences, but mistakes, and they're different. A learning experience is when you do something wrong once. A mistake is when you do the same thing wrong multiple times. Right. Um, if I can help, if I can provide a little bit of a clear way to 
possibly frame an idea or solve a problem and help somebody to help somebody. I love teaching. I love lecturing. I've been very fortunate. I've taught everywhere from Ivy League to my daughter's high school class. And when you connect with somebody, wow, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. You know, best part of my job is leading a high-performing team, creating a team, high-performing, making them, and then really helping them grow and learn. The book for me was an opportunity to give a little bit back um, and maybe help. If I help somebody figure something out and avoid some of the pain that I've had in my career, then I'm doing something right. And I can yeah. sleep well at night knowing that you know, maybe I've given back. Absolutely. Well, I definitely think you have. And I, you know, I really want to thank you for taking the time to continue to share your learnings and wisdom here on the podcast once again. And hopefully we'll have you back yet again at some time in the future. So thanks again. You so guys are doing you. great work. You're, you're always at the center of what people think and how they think. And so much of our success collectively is in understanding the how, not just the what. So I appreciate the opportunity to be on with you today. Absolutely. Everyone, please go and check out uh, Doug's book, Moving Your Brand Out of the Fred Zone, available on Amazon, everywhere books are sold. Be sure to check it out. So on behalf of Susie and Adwee team, thanks again to the great Doug Zarkin, marketer and author, for joining us once again here today. Be sure to subscribe, rate, review the Speed of Culture podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Until next time, see you home. Take care. Speed of Culture is brought to you by Suzy as part of the Adweek Podcast Network and A Guest Creator Network. You can listen and subscribe to all Adweek's podcasts by visiting adweek.com slash podcasts. To find out more about Suzy, head to suzy.com. And make sure to search for the Speed of Culture in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Click follow so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Suzy, thanks for listening.